Welcome back to Deep Learning, to the last video where we discuss the different algorithms regarding generative adversarial networks. And today we want to look into the fifth part of our lecture, and these are essentially more tricks of the trade concerning guns. One trick that can help you quite a bit is one-sided label smoothing. So what you may want to do is, is replace your targets of the real samples with a smoothed version. So instead of using a 1 probability, you use a 0.9 probability. But you do not use the same for the fake samples. So you don't change their label to 0. Because Otherwise, this will reinforce incorrect behavior, so your generator would produce samples that resemble the data or samples it already makes. Benefits are that you can prevent the discriminator from giving very large gradients to your generator, and you also prevent extrapolating to encourage extreme samples. Is balancing between the generator and the discriminator necessary? Uh, no, it's not. The GANs work by estimating the ratio of data and model density. So the ratio is estimated correctly only when the discriminator is optimal. So it's fine if your discriminator overpowers the generator. When the discriminator gets too good, your gradients, of course, may vanish. Then you can use tricks like the non-saturating loss, the Wasserstein GANs, as we talked about earlier. And you may also run into the problem that your generator's gradients may get too large. And in this case, you can use the trick of label smoothing. Of course, you can also work with deep convolutional GANs. So this is DC GAN, where you implement a deep learning approach into the generator. So you can replace pooling layers with striated convolutions and transposed convolutions. You can fully remove the connected hidden layers for deeper architectures. And the generator then you typically uses ReLU activations except for the output layer in which you use a tongue and superbolicos. And the discriminator, for example, here uses a leaky ReLU activation for all the layers. And they use batch normalization. And if you do that, then you may end up in the following problem. You can see here some generation results. And within the batches, there may be a very strong intra-batch correlation. So within the batch, all of the generated images look very similar. And this brings us to the concept of virtual batch normalization. So you don't want to use one batch normalization instance for both many batches. You could use two separate batch normalizations, or even better, you use the virtual batch normalization. And in case this is too expensive, you choose instance normalization for each sample and subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. In case you choose virtual batch normalization, then you create a reference batch R of random samples and fix them once at the start of the training. And then for each xi of the current mini batch, you create a new virtual batch that is the reference batch union the xi. And then you compute the mean and standard deviation of this virtual batch. And you always need to propagate then r forward in addition to the current batch. This then allows you to normalize xi with these statistics. So this may be kind of expensive, but we have seen that this is very useful for stabilizing the training and remove the intra-batch correlations. There's also the idea of historical averaging. So there you add a penalty term that punishes weights which are rather far away from the historical average. And this 
historical average of the parameters can then be updated in an online fashion. Similar tricks from reinforcement learning can also work for generative adversarial networks like experience replay. You keep a replay buffer of past generations and occasionally show them. And you keep checkpoints from the past generator and discriminator and occasionally swap them out for a few iterations. So if you do so, then you can do things like the DC gun. Here are bedrooms after just one epoch. And you can see that you are able to generate quite a few different bedrooms. So very interesting what kind of diversity in terms of generation you can actually achieve. <laughs>
recurrent neural networks, so you can unroll over several of those iterations using stochastic gradient descent and the different parameter sets. So you get this kind of unrolled gradients over the forward pass over several iterations. And then this allows to build a computational graph describing several steps of learning in the discriminator. So you backpropagate through all of the steps when you compute the generator's gradient. So fully maximizing the discriminator's value function is intractable, of course. So you have to stop at a low number of k, but you can see that already with a low number like 10, this substantially reduces the mode collapse. So here is an example for the unrolled gun. Here we have the target function. With the standard gun, you have this alternating mode. And with the unrolled gun, you can then see that in step 0, you still have the same distribution. But already in step 5, you can see that the distribution is spread over a much larger area. In step number 10,000, you can see that the entire domain is filled. After 15,000 steps, you form a ring. After 20,000 steps, you can see that there are certain maxima appearing. And after 25,000 steps, we really manage to mimic the original target distribution. You can also use GANs for semi-supervised learning. So here the idea is to use the GAN by turning a K-class problem into a K plus 1 class problem. And there you have the true classes, which are the target classes for the supervised learning. And then you have some additional class, which are fake inputs that have been generated by our generator G then the probability of being real is essentially the sum of all the real classes and the discriminator is then used as a classifier within the GAN game. Again, we can also use other ideas from our deep learning, for example, the Laplacian pyramid, and you can also do a Laplacian pyramid of GANs. So we have observed so far that GANs are pretty good at generating low resolution images, but the high resolution images are much more difficult. And here you can then start by generating low resolution images. So here we go from right to left. So they would start with generating from noise, a small resolution image. Then you have a generator that takes the generated image as a condition and additional noise to generate an update for the high frequency to upscale the image. And then you can do this again in the next scale, where you try to predict again the high frequencies of these images. You add the high frequencies and use this to upscale. And again, you can get an upscaled image that is missing high frequencies again. You use this as a conditioning vector on generating the high frequency image and put back the high frequencies. So step by step, we use conditional GANs to generate the missing high frequencies in this context. So you train the generators by training a discriminator on each level and the input for the discriminator are the different images. So you downsize the image step by step and from the downscaled image, you can then compute the difference image and the difference image between the two will give you the correct high frequencies and you train the discriminator in a way that it can differentiate the correctly generated high frequencies from the artificially generated high frequencies. So this is the LabGAN training. But still, we only have 64 by 64 pixels. Another idea are stack guns, and this is now used for generating photorealistic images from text. So the task is you have some text and generate a fitting image, and you decompose the problem into sketch refinement using a two-stage conditional gun. The analogon, of course, here is that, for example, in human painting, you would first sketch and then draw the fine details. 
So you have the stage one GAN that draws a low resolution image and it's conditioned with the text descriptions and it paints a rough shape and basic colors from the given text and the background. And the stage two GAN is then generating the high resolution images conditioned on stage one result and the text descriptions and it corrects for defects and adds details. So here are some examples where you have the text description we are generating birds here from descriptions and you can see that the stage one generation still is missing many details and with the stage two generation a lot of the problems that have been caused in stage one are fixed and you can see that the new images have a much much higher and better resolution and you can see the whole paper in reference 20. So let's summarize. GANs are generative models that use supervised learning to approximate an intractable cost function. You can simulate many different cost functions. It's actually hard to find an equilibrium between the discriminator and the generator. It cannot generate discrete data, by the way, but you can use it for semi-supervised classification, transfer learning, multimodal outputs, domain transfer, there's also a lot of papers right now out that can also do high resolution output. There's papers like Big Gun, for example, that does really highly resolved images. <laughs>